Welcome to Toastmasters Bay to Bay, where we feature speakers from San Francisco to Monterey. My name is Henry Miller, and I'm your host. At this time, we are in the middle of our international speech contest season, our spring season. And tonight, we are going to bring you two speakers who competed at the division level and the other at the area level. Our first speaker tonight is Mr. Mark Stibing. And Mark is going to be speaking <laughs> from our communication manual, project number 10, Inspire Your Audience. And the title of Mark's speech is Self-Honesty. Self-Honesty, Mark Stibing. Yogi Berra, when he was a Major League Baseball player, said, I never blame myself when I'm not hitting. I blame the bat. <laughs> and if it just keeps up, I change bats. Fellow Toastmasters, Mr. Toastmaster, Yogi could have stopped after the first four words. I never blame myself. This is a credo that way too many of us live by. Let me give you an example. The other night, my wife and I went to dinner, and she asked me to wear a sport coat, so I was dressed a lot like I am right now. And I'm sitting across from her, as I'm reaching for my second piece of bread, the sleeve on my jacket caught the glass of wine and tipped the wine over. I grab my napkin, I'm dabbing, I'm looking, did anybody see? And then I ask myself, what happened? Now, in case you don't know, what happened is code for who can I blame? <laughs> well, it's obvious, isn't it? I can blame my wife. She told me to wear the jacket. If I wasn't wearing the jacket, I wouldn't have knocked the glass of wine over. Obviously, it's her fault. But let's be serious for a second. Can we really blame my wife? Because if you think about it, didn't the waiter put the glass of wine between me and the bread bowl? <laughs> or couldn't we blame the chef because he made the bread so delicious that I had to reach for a second piece? It's getting kind of ridiculous. We keep going deeper and deeper into excuses, and eventually I'm going to blame my own mother for giving birth to me. <laughs> so. Let's look at the same situation, but let's look at it from two different perspectives. The first one is what we'll call step outside to see the truth. Now, how many of you agree with me that it was my wife's fault that I knocked over the glass of wine? Okay, thank you. <laughs> now, how many of you think it was my fault that I knocked over the glass of wine? Yes, and that's the point. If I could put myself in your shoes and see this from an unbiased perspective, I'd get more accurate picture of what just happened, and I wouldn't blame my wife, maybe. And so the second perspective is, let's take the blame anyway. If I'm willing to accept the blame, no matter how much of it really belongs to me, then the next time I'm sitting at the dinner table, I might be more careful with my arm as I'm reaching for the bread bowl. I might do something different to cause a different outcome. Well, that's a pretty light example. Let's look at one that's a little bit more poignant. Where I work, there were several product marketing people, and one of them, let's call him Alex, just to protect his identity. Alex came into work at, say, 9 in the morning, left typically about 5. You could say he wasn't the most productive of the product marketing people. Well, unfortunately, we had layoffs, as a lot of companies are, and Alex was let go. Now, imagine that you met Alex at a gathering, and you said, hey, Alex, what happened? It's very likely he's going to say something like, oh, my boss didn't like me, or we just had layoffs and I was the unlucky one, like it was a random event. Well, I don't blame Alex for not wanting to talk about his failings. None of us want to do that. But what is he thinking up here? Let's pretend that he could look at the situation from those same two perspectives. The first is stepping outside to see the truth. If he could put himself in my shoes, he would see that he was the least productive of the three product people. And so he would get the perspective of what's really happening in him and why he was the one that was chosen to be let go. And the second perspective is to take the blame anyway. If he's willing to take the blame anyway, then next time he might do something different. At his next job, he could be the most productive product marketer and not have this happen again to him. Now, Alex, blaming his boss is no different than me blaming my wife for spilling the glass of wine, or Yogi Berra 
blaming the bat for not being able to hit. In each case, the major actor was trying to push responsibility off onto someone or something else. Next time any of you find yourself in the situation where there's a bump in the road, whether it's a big bump like losing a job or a tiny bump like spilling a glass of wine, I ask that you just do these two simple things. First, step outside to see the truth. Put yourself in someone else's shoes and take a look at that situation from their perspective, an unbiased perspective. And second, take the blame anyway. If you're willing to take the blame anyway, then you're in a position where you can learn the lessons that life is trying so hard to teach you. We can all come up with many, many people to blame whenever we're making excuses. The least we can do is be honest with ourselves. Mr. Toastmaster. Mark, that was a wonderful speech. When I first heard it, I said to myself, I could learn a lot from this guy. Thank you. <laughs> How long have you been a Toastmaster? Almost a year. Almost a year. A year. And Mark, you are competing at the, 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 the area, area level. level. Mm -hmm. That is wonderful. Thank you. That is, that is a great achievement. And how long did it take you to write this speech or prepare uh, I worked on this for probably 20 or 30 hours before I gave it the first time. Hardest speech I ever gave. Did you drive everybody crazy? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and how, how did your wife take the speech? You know, she didn't see it until I had given it at the area level. Oh. And that was the first time she had seen it. And what was the feedback? She, she thought it was great. Of course, she always has critiques, don't they always? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and how did you take the critique? <laughs> Very well, honey. Very well. <laughs> so, I, uh, what, what next? What, what, what's next for you? Are you going to continue competing? You know, I'd really like to compete again at the international level next year. Uh -huh. It was such a fun speech to write. It was so, I don't know, it was difficult, but it was so fun. It was fun. Mm -hmm. So you enjoyed the journey? A absolutely. The well, challenge is the key. The challenge. But that is what Toastmasters is all about. It challenges you. And I, I, you did a wonderful job. And I'm really happy to see your, the level you have risen to in just one year. I think this is quite an achievement. And I really look forward to hearing much more from you in the future. Now, to give you an evaluation, I have an evaluator here for you, Mr. Robert Van Horn. <laughs> Thank you. Robert? Thank you very much. Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, thank you, Mark, for a very inspiring speech about self-honesty. I think you've met all the requirements for giving a very motivational speech. Your speech contained humor, and it also flowed very easily. Now, whenever I evaluate a speech, I ask myself three questions. What do I see? What do I hear? And lastly, what do I feel? And Mark, your speech, in seeing you speak, first of all, I see that you're very well dressed, which is very professional looking. You also have very natural hand gestures when you speak. And your overall body language really helps the audience feel comfortable. What did I hear when he spoke? Mark has a strong voice, yet it's friendly voice. He made us laugh. He pronounces his words very clearly. He projects his voice. How did I feel when Mark spoke? Probably the best word that I heard when Mark spoke was sincerity. He speaks from the heart with sincerity, trying to convey his portrayal of self-honesty. Mark, I would like to give you two suggestions on how to improve your speech. And these are just suggestions. First of all, when you walk or when you're out in front of an audience, don't take long steps like this. Try to walk more naturally back and forth, from side to side, talking to this side of the audience. 
and talking to this side of the audience. The other suggestion, Mark, is to find a way of using both sides of the audience. Don't just stay over on this particular side. Mark, a wonderful speech. I congratulate you on self-honesty. I look for future speeches that you may give. Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you very much. Ever so often, we visit clubs in our district. And one of the oldest clubs in our district is Lee Emerson Bassett. The Lee Emerson Bassett Club, better known as LEB. Tonight, we'll be visiting with them. I now present to you Lee Emerson Bassett. LEB uh, Toastmasters was, is one of the oldest clubs in the nation. It was founded in 1935. It's named after Lee Emerson Bassett. He was a professor at Stanford University and he was the original person who set up the club. LEB Toastmasters is one of the largest clubs in the area. We have probably 60 members, up to 30 usually come into every meeting. Uh, every club is different. Some clubs are very small and intimate. You have a chance to speak quite often. Uh, our club is very large, so you certainly speak less often than some other clubs, but you're able to gain a lot from the people that you watch each week. We have members and people coming from all over the Bay Area. It's a very diverse club. We have people working in com large companies and entrepreneurs and government and in private business. I think what sets LEB apart is the variety with the membership. Uh, being on the Stanford campus and the business school in particular, you have a very diverse group of people. Some students, some professionals from Silicon Valley, a number of attorneys, a number of other people from various walks of life. And everyone comes together and brings their own strengths and weaknesses. We have some members who have been in this group for over 25 years. We have some, like myself, who've joined within the last six months. People are very friendly here. People have go to dinners once in a while on a regular basis, actually. We meet for um, some social events, you know, birthdays, things like that. So there's a lot of going on besides just the meeting itself. We have a lot of energetic speakers every week. Yeah, they, we've got some real characters here. Some people, you know, some people are just funny every week. Others are just very powerful in their approach. That's again one of the benefits. You get to you pick up some skills from all the different styles of speech. What brought you into Toastmasters? When I have to stand up and talk about anything in the room that has more than three people present, I get completely scared. Actually. And uh, I realize I have to do something about it because communication is extremely important. We live in a world where we know full of people. I would definitely recommend anybody who thinks that you know they need presentation skills and speaking skills, which probably is everybody, to join at least some club and you know participate regularly. I'm an attorney. I've worked at large firms in the past, and recently I've gone out to open up my own practice. And I realize now I'm going to have a lot more opportunities to be speaking in a public setting. But within the last six months, I can certainly feel a progression. I feel less nervous when I have to get up and speak. I still feel my heart beating and fluttering a little bit at the beginning, but at least I'm not panicked the night before. Are you okay? I said, yes, I'm fine. But, oh, okay, I'm sorry, I thought you were drowning. <laughs> Welcome back. Our second speaker tonight is Shilpa Ver. And Shilpa is going to be demonstrating to us how to handle vocal variety. And the title of Shilpa's speech, The Ship and the Lifeboat. The Ship and the Lifeboat, Shilpa Ver. Which is the best ship of all? Anyone? Friendship. Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and welcome guests. I'm sure that all of you have taken many trips on this ship. Tonight, let me share one of my trips with all of you and tell you about my friend Anuj. Let's go back to summer of 1996, when I was a shy 19-year-old small town girl who just got a big internship in a big company in a big city. The very first day, my teammate Anna introduced me to him. Hi, I'm Anuj. 
Hi, I'm Shilpa. Welcome. Now I have to shake that thing, right? Okay. And then we spoke for about 15 minutes. Now my small town experience told me that if a guy talks to you so much, he just wants to hook up with you. So what followed after this was the most embarrassing conversation of my life. So Shilpa, I have to run now. But how about we catch up later over lunch and talk more about your project? I don't want to date you. <laughs> Excuse me? Yeah, I read an article on dangers of dating yesterday, and I don't want to go out on a date with you. Princess, all I offered you was a working lunch in cafeteria, not my hand in marriage. Do you even know what a date is? He caught me. I'm not sure, but whatever that is, we are not doing it. <laughs> Over the next few months, however, we became the best buddies. He introduced me to all the new things, new foods, new cultures, new concepts, new ideas, new thinking. From a small, shy, small town girl, he helped me transform into a young, calm, confident, ambitious woman who was not afraid of shaking hands. And a year later, Anuj left for the United States. But before he left, I gave him a picture from, of me to remember me by. But he didn't want my best picture. He chose a picture of me in my school uniform, 10th grade, holding a debate trophy. No, 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 no. I cannot give you this one. This is the only copy, and I need it. OK, but I just want a memory of you that nobody else has. Can you give that? I gave him the picture. Nine years passed. I got married, came to the United States, and got busy with life. I spoke to Anuj about three or four times a year, but whenever we spoke, we picked up right where we left, and every conversation lasted hours. While I enjoyed marital bliss and got a loving spouse, Anuj didn't do so well. In 2006, he married a girl who he thought loved him. But it turned out that she was only interested in getting a green card and coming to the United States. That marriage ended in an unpleasant divorce that left Anuj shattered, deeply hurt, and heartbroken. I spoke to him as and when I could. One Saturday morning, I got a call from Anuj. It hurts right now. It really does. But I will get through it. I have friends. I have you. I cried for hours after that call. Six months later, I flew to New York to meet him. That night, after a gap of one decade, we sat face to face and talked heart to heart. Through tears in my eyes, I apologized to him for not being there in his tough times. You were there, he said. You were always there. I was puzzled. He got up and brought that old picture that I had given him and showed it to me. And he said, after my divorce, I was going around the house, destroying every memory of my marriage when I came across this. And it reminded me that there are still several people in this world who love me and who care about me. And that no matter how badly one person hurt me, there are several others who would gladly part with a cherished memory of theirs so I can remember them. I was stunned. In that one moment, I realized that friendship was not a ship anymore. Especially for Anuj, it was a lifeboat that had helped me, him through the troubled waters of his life and offered him hope. So Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters and guests, do not underestimate the power of friendship. No friendship can cross the path of your destiny without leaving some mark on it forever. 
though communication may wane in times of absence, it is still a force that emanates in the background. So I urge you all, make a new friend or call an old one. Tell them that, they, that you value them. Tell them that you're lucky to have them in your life. Keep in touch. For you might become someone's lifeboat. Mr. Toastmaster. Shilpa, you really touched me with that speech. Thank you. How long have you been a Toastmaster? Almost four years. Four years. And you seem to really get into this speech. What motivated you to write this speech or give this speech as a contest? There are several moments in your life that touch you very, very deeply. And it is always a pleasure if you can share them with others. Was and it difficult to share it with an, an audience? At first it was. I have given this speech three or four times. The first time when I gave it, I actually gave it sitting down and I cried halfway. So yes, it was. <laughs> So what, what do I get? The lifeboat or the ship? How much effort are you willing to put into it? Oh? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's a fair answer. <laughs> You'll get both. Just get give both. it a shot. <laughs> well, I really admire your development. And I look forward to hearing you, to seeing you come back next year. Yes, definitely. Thank you. To evaluate your speech, I will now introduce Shilpa Ver, who will, who is one of our district go, uh, division governors. Division governor, Shilpa Ver. Oh, sorry, Hasha, Hasha. Thank you, Sir Toastmaster, and especially Shilpa and all the Toastmasters here, and guests, of course. Wow, what a, what a very emotional speech. Shilpa, you came out here and you started with a little bit of hesitation to start with, but you came out here and opened up to all of us. It seemed to me like you were with your friend. Your initial, the way you described yourself coming in, getting into the new environment and changing changing your lifestyle, changing your outlook. So you did a pretty very good job introducing us to the subject, getting us all kind of inside within you. And you, speak, you spoke with a great sincerity. You came from the heart and you could see that. I could almost see that emotion, that tear that you were holding back. So I, I could almost see that. And I think that's a very good gesture, very good emotional, and it speaks to sincerity. You then brought us back into the United States here and how you got engr engrossed in your life and, that, and, and how you kind of got touched back again with the, the incident and the effort you made to go out and reach out to your friend to help him in his need. I think that's a good way to really get yourself uh, realizing. You realize that you really need to be with him and help him in his need. One thing, suggestion I would like have for you is that when you are uh, out here and uh, talking about the picture, you tried to move around somewhat. You did in one case, and you moved around here. And I would uh, suggest that you could probably do a little bit more with some more hand gestures. And even like you're saying, oh, why didn't I go there when he really wanted to? I should have been there earlier for him. You know, just giving yourself some more gesture add to that. You definitely met the gestures that you were intending to met. You know, the vocal variety, that was good. You were high, low. You did pretty good in that area. And I really enjoyed. And I sincerely hope that maybe the next speech that you will be giving will be more towards the success of your friend, where he is today. Thank you. Mr. Asha, yeah, sure. stay with me one minute. Oh, one okay. minute. All right. How long have you been a Toastmaster? I've been a Toastmaster for about eight years with a break of a year or, or two. Yeah. 
Yes. And uh, you, are you enjoying your Toastmaster experience? Oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm loving this. I'm loving the Toastmaster experience because one of the greatest advantage of a Toastmaster's uh, uh, entity is the, the actually the structure that where you can come back and really have a, a, a hands-on experience with whatever you're trying to achieve. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. You just heard two wonderful speakers. One who has been a Toastmaster for just one year and the other for four years. This is what Toastmasters is all about. Helping you to improve your communication skills. This is why we joined Toastmasters. When you are a Toastmaster, you are always looking for ways to improve as a speaker. This is why we give evaluations. We evaluate to motivate. The evaluators will tell you what you did well and show you what you can improve. We have clubs throughout from San Francisco to Monterey. And these clubs are clubs that will always, you can always visit. Toastmasters clubs are all over our region. And as you, when you visit a club, you will be welcomed. You will be welcomed with open arms. So find a Toastmasters club near you and enjoy the Toastmasters experience. Thank you. Oh boy. Oh boy.